paused, but it's going now. So, and I don't know if this is going to be bothersome or not, but uh, my neighbor's having a tree cut down and uh, they've got the chipper not too far outside of our house. So you may be picking that up a little bit today. Actually, let me see which microphone I'm using. It might not be too much of a problem. Yeah, I'll be pretty close to the microphone. Okay, yesterday we got introduced to the idea of momentum for the first time. And one key idea that came out of yesterday in the absence of external forces or before they can act, the momentum of a system remains constant. And so we'll be looking at some things today such as uh, collisions and stuff like that and um, see how those ideas show up when we're thinking about those. Um, yesterday we introduced the idea of momentum for the first time and we use the letter P to stand for momentum and it's the mass of something times its velocity and we could write this with arrows on here. We're mostly just going to do one-dimensional problems and so um, we'll not worry about the arrows so much. If we want a direction, we can use a minus sign. But for today, start with the idea of a collision between two things and momentum being conserved. And I had just looked up some uh, information here this morning on weights of different things. And so this is supposed to represent a, uh, like a garbage truck. And I looked up on the weight of a garbage truck and let's see, the average loaded garbage truck has a weight of about 2.5 tons. Um, Now, those are American units, and they're units of weight, not um, mass. And so we'll have to do a little bit of conversion, but it turns out the weight is proportional to the mass. And so we may be able to get away with that. All right, but then down here on the road, we'll imagine that we have a... Uh, a car here and this has a weight of maybe 1.5 tons with the driver and so might be able to work this out now the thing is um, weight is equal to mg the mass is going to equal the weight divided by g so We may be able to make this stuff work out okay without having to convert all of this into other things. Otherwise, we could, whoops, this isn't 2.5, it's actually supposed to be 25. We could do this, one ton um, times 2,000 pounds per ton times Let's see. I think it's 4.448 newtons per pound, if I remember right, um, is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. We can figure out the mass of one ton, and that should work out okay. Oops, always works better if I turn on my calculator first. 
And we were doing a problem today in engineering physics where I uh, had it show all my significant figures. Okay, 2000. Okay. Okay. Um, one ton has a mass of about 900 kilograms. So we can figure those out. Um, the mass of this DT, oops, it's a garbage truck. The mass of this GT is 25 times that. So And so about 23,000, roughly, kilograms. And then the mass of that 1.5 ton truck is just going to be about um, we'll just say 1,300 kilograms for that. So we're going to imagine a collision between these two things. And we'll suppose that the little car here, it's not such a little car, but it's stopped at a stoplight. And so um, the initial situation is that the velocity of the car is zero and the dump truck or the garbage truck driver is driving along the velocity of the GT garbage truck is driving along but he's talking on his cell phone and he just spilled a little bit of coffee in his lap so he's not paying attention to what he's doing and doesn't notice that this car is stopped at a red light in front of him so he's going along at maybe we'll make it not too terrible but maybe 20 meters per second and so that's the situation now in the final situation how fast are they going? Let's imagine that the car gets stuck on the dump truck or it's what we would call a completely inelastic collision, which means the two objects are stuck together after the collision. How fast are they going, going to be going? Going to be going. Well, we can't use energy here because there will be energy lost in a collision like this. For one thing, it'll make a horrendous noise when the dump truck hits the car. And so that will take energy out of it. Also, it's going to deform the metal of the car and possibly deform the front of the garbage truck a little bit too. And it takes energy to do that. So energy, mechanical energy of kinetic energy will be lost in this situation, but momentum is not lost. Momentum is always conserved. And so something that I can say is the momentum before the collision, which would be the mass of the dump truck times the velocity, oops, it's a garbage truck, I keep forgetting, times the velocity of the garbage truck plus the mass of the car times the initial velocity of the car, which happens to be zero, so this isn't going to contribute, that will equal the mass of what we have after the collision, which is going to be the mass of the garbage truck plus the mass of the car, and then the, I'll just call it V final, that's the velocity of the combined car dump truck system immediately after the collision. Okay, eventually, they're going to stop fairly quickly, actually, because when the dump truck driver hits the car, he'd probably wake up and realize he should push on the brakes. But immediately after that collision, momentum will be conserved. It'll be before those outside forces, like the friction between the tires and the road, start to act to slow the thing down. Well, here's what we've got. The velocity of the car is zero. So 
mass of the garbage truck, 23,000 kilograms. times that initial velocity of it, 20 meters per second, plus zero, since the velocity of the car is zero, that will equal the combined mass of the dump, or the garbage truck and the car, which would be 23,000 plus 1,300. That would add up to 24,300 kilograms. times V final. Okay, well, we can solve this. The only thing we don't know is V final. So V final will equal the 23,000 kilograms times 20 meters per second divided by 24,300 kilograms and the kilograms divide out, we've got those top and bottom, and we'll end up with meters per second. And I'm just going to do this in two steps here. If I just take the ratio of the masses, I get 0.95 times the 20 meters per second. And that ends up being V final, if I multiply that times 20, yeah, I get about 19 meters per second. So maybe the dump truck driver wouldn't even notice that sudden loss of one meter per second to the speed of the dump truck. And he may keep trying to take care of his spilled coffee or whatever it is. In fact, maybe it was the collision that would cause the coffee to spill. He just wasn't paying attention. But anyway, it barely slows down. When you have something very massive running into something that's a lot less massive, um, this is, I don't know. Yeah, it's, well, it's not quite 1 23rd. It's maybe about 1 15th the mass of the thing. We could do that. Um, yeah, the dump truck or the garbage truck's about 18 times the mass of the car. And so it's not going to slow down very much. It only lost about one meter per second of its stuff, its speed. But if instead you had a little car that's moving along at the slow rate of speed, or the same speed, 20 meters per second, and the dump truck is stopped at the red light this time, so got the dump truck there. This looks like a bigger dump truck, but it's the same one, just not drawn to scale. So. This one, V initial is zero for this thing. And the car sticks to the back of the dump truck. How fast is the stuff going to be going after the collision? Well, momentum before is gonna equal momentum after. So we'll have initial momentum equals final momentum. And so initially all we have is the mass of the car times V car, which is what this is, plus the mass of the garbage truck times zero. And that will equal, afterwards we'll assume again that they stick together after the collision. Um, Later today, we'll start considering situations where um, maybe they bounce off of each other or something like that. But here, we'll have them stick together. So we'll have the mass of the car plus mass of the garbage truck times V final, the speed of that wreckage. 
since this one's zero, um, we can ignore it. The V final, I'm doing this in letters first, which is my preference for solving problems. And just to solve all the way through it with letters, divide by the total mass there. So I'll have the mass of the car divided by the mass of the car plus the mass of the garbage truck times that V of the car. And I swap the left and right sides here just so I could have that written there. Okay, so what we get in this case, mass of the car was 1300 kilograms. The mass of the car plus the mass of the garbage truck ends up being 1300 plus 23,000. That's 24,300 kilograms. And then we're multiplying that by the velocity of the car, which was those 20 meters per second. And we'll see what we get here. So Okay, and we get about one meter per second, which is not much. And what that means is when the car rear ends the dump truck, the wreckage after the collision is not going to be moving very fast. You can walk faster than that. So the dump truck wins both times. Any questions on that? We're using conservation of momentum there. Um, here's one that's uh, kind of a, an unusual problem or one that throws some new information at you. Water from a fire hose is directed horizontally against a wall at a rate of 50 kilograms per second and a speed of 42 meters per second. Calculate the magnitude of the force exerted on the wall, assuming that the water's horizontal momentum is reduced to zero. Okay, well, we're going to use the idea of uh, impulse to try to figure this out. And impulse is equal to the change of momentum. And let's see. So we'll just imagine here that uh, I'll put the wall over here. So there's the wall and We've got this stream of water that's coming over here and hitting the wall and then just stopping and dribbling down and making a puddle right here. So if I let positive be to the right, I'm going to assume that V initial is going to equal, um, well, let's just take one second's worth of, of the water. 50 kilograms. Okay, that's how much water would hit the wall in one second. And this is um, 42 meters per second is its speed, which is 90 miles an hour. This would knock you down. And this is the amount of water in one second. Actually, this is P initial times M is what it happens to be, except the velocity is negative. So the momentum of one second's worth of water is going to be P initial is going to be the product of these two, but it does get a minus sign because it's going in the negative direction. And I just chose that to be the negative direction. I usually forget to do that. Um, so I 
and it ends up being 2100 minus actually 2.10 times 10 to the third kilogram meters per second is what we happen to have for the momentum of that one second's worth of water. Now, P final for that water is zero. The water's horizontal momentum is reduced to zero. So that's what P final is. The impulse, and I'm just gonna use I for impulse here, I is equal to the average force times how long that force acts for, and that will equal the change in momentum, which is P final minus P initial. Okay, well, F average delta T is gonna equal P final, which is zero, minus the initial momentum, which is minus 2.10 times 10 to the third, whoops, kilogram meters per second, or F average delta T is equal to 2.10 times 10 to the third kilogram meters per second. Okay, now, I want to know what F average is, the magnitude of the force exerted on the wall. Actually, this average force I'm going to get is the force that the wall exerts on the water, but what do you know about the force that the water exerts on the wall? They're third law partners. They're equal and opposite. And the delta T here that's going to matter is how long did it take to deliver that much water to the wall? It took 1.00 seconds. And so that's what delta T is gonna happen to be because I used the mass that gets delivered in one second. So that average force is going to equal 2.10 times 10 to the third kilogram meters per second divided by 1.00 seconds. I just divided by my one second time interval. And since I'm dividing by one, the only thing this does is change the units from kilogram meters per second into something else. If I divide kilogram meters per second by one second, and if I think of that one second as being divided by one, that doesn't change it, changes into an invert and multiply thing. And I get kilogram meters per second squared. Well, that's a Newton, okay? And so that average force, since I'm dividing by one, I don't change my number, ends up being 2.10 times 10 to the third Newtons. That's the force that the wall exerts on the water, but it's also equal to the force that the water exerts on the wall. So if I multiply by one pound over 4.448 Newtons, this force will end up being, I don't know how much, um, around 500. Nope. 470. Now, this is a force. I don't have to convert units on this, but we're not that familiar with forces in Newtons. Um, this turns out to be 470 pounds. So that would be enough to knock you over if you had a sudden 470 pound force applied sideways to you. It wouldn't be very comfortable if you tried to stay standing up. So. So there's one, a change in momentum problem. And this was using impulse again. The impulse is equal to the change in momentum. The impulse is the average force times delta T. So we have that.
Okay. Um, this may seem like a weird problem, but we can approach it using our momentum techniques here. We have a 0 0.450 kilogram hammer moving horizontally at seven meters per second. And I'm going to draw a fairly primitive hammer here. So we'll just imagine that guys using a sledgehammer to build his house with. And uh, so here's the nail that's going partway into the wood. And he's going to hammer it a little farther into the wood. So we've got that. And this thing is headed in that direction at 7.00 meters per second. Strikes a nail and comes to rest after driving the nail one centimeter into the board, calculate the duration of the impact. Well, the hammer is moving at first and it comes to rest. So for the hammer, the change in momentum is going to be MV final minus MV initial. But V final is zero, so the final momentum is zero, and it's just going to equal minus MV initial. But let's see. Drives the nail one centimeter into the board. Hmm. Can we figure out how long that's going to take? equal F average times delta T. Well, this is actually going to pull something from way earlier in the quarter. If we had uh, we've got our V squared equals V naught squared plus 2A delta X that's one equation. I can figure out the acceleration from here. The final velocity is zero. V naught is seven meters per second. The delta x, the distance it travels through while it's coming to rest, is the one centimeter. And so I could solve that for the acceleration. Now, once I know that acceleration, I could probably use this equation, V final equals V initial plus AT, whoops, plus not equals, V initial plus AT. These are our couple of our constant acceleration equations. Uh, v final is zero. V initial again is the seven meters per second. A we just figured out from this equation. And so we know everything in this equation except T. So that would be the duration of the impact. And let's see what we can get. This is going to be zero. The hammer is stopping. V naught is seven meters per second. So zero will equal 7.00 meters per second squared plus two times A times 1.00 centimeters, I'm going to write that as meters, and I just have to replace the centa, the C on there, with times 10 to the minus 2. And that's the equation I have to solve. And so let's see, kick this across, the negative of 7.00 meters per second squared divided by 2 times 1.00 meters per second squared. Whoops, that's not what it is. Meters to the minus 2, or times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Ah, let me write that again. 1.00, I had my hand covering it and couldn't read what I was doing. There we go. All right, and that will equal A when I'm done with it. Um, let's see. 
well, we could do it in our heads, but still, it just gives me the acceleration. So that's 49 divided by, that's what seven squared is, um, two times one P minus two. And I can keep three sig figs. So I get uh, minus 2.45 times 10 to the third. <clears throat> uh, let's see. I'll have meters per second squared divided by meters. That's meters per second squared. Or meters squared per second squared is what I had. So that many. That's a pretty big acceleration. But I guess hammers are used to that. And... So are nails too. So that's, uh, now that's not the duration of the impact yet, I'm, but I'm working my way there. Now I go to the V final equals V initial plus AT. And uh, V final is zero. V initial is 7.00 meters per second. The acceleration is minus 2.45. Times 10 to the third meters per second squared times T. So I think what I'll do is bring this across, it becomes positive. 2.45 times 10 to the third meters per second times T equals 7.00 meters per second. The time's not going to be very long. 7.00 meters per second divided by 2.45 times 10 to the third meters per second squared. I didn't copy that down. I did have it right there. Unit wise, if I divide meters per second by meters per second squared, <coughs> just do it here. Flip it and multiply and convince yourself that you'll end up with seconds. So and it's not very long. It ends up being 2.86 times 10 to the minus third seconds. Or that's not legible. But anyway, 2.86 times 10 to the minus third seconds, that's 2.86 milliseconds, which isn't very long. Then it says, what was the average force exerted on the nail? Hmm. Well, I'll go to my impulse equation. The impulse is going to equal the change in momentum, and it's the average force times t, the time that it acted for. I just figured out t, the change in momentum, well in this case the only thing that had momentum was the hammer, seven meters per second going in that direction. Delta p is going to equal the mass of the hammer times v final for the hammer minus the mass of the hammer times V initial for the hammer. Okay. And that will equal that average force times delta T. Okay, so I didn't pick a positive direction here that I know of. Actually, I had speed squared here, so this I did have a negative thing for the acceleration. Okay, looks like I unconsciously chose left to be positive here. And so um, that's okay. Our average force will end up being negative. That's in the direction opposite the initial velocity. So uh, this is zero the final velocity of the hammer because it stops. And so the average force is going to be minus the mass of the hammer 
0 0.450 kilograms. This is the first time we've used the mass of it. We had preliminary work to do first. The initial for the hammer, which is 7.00 meters per second, divided by our delta T, which is 2.86 times 10 to the minus third seconds. And this may be a fairly hefty force. Uh, let's see. Okay, and I get about, um, 1.10 times 10 to the third with a minus sign because I still have that minus sign and the minus sign just tells me that it's that way. I unconsciously chose my positive sign to be that way. And the force is kilogram meter per second divided by seconds, which turns into kilogram meter per second squared, which is Newton's and so we do get there. So an 1100 Newton force is what's exerted on that hammer. Okay, um, this one, we wanted to use some momentum stuff to figure out that average force, but first we had to figure out how long the, the impact lasted. And I had to go back, all the way back to my constant acceleration equations to figure that out. So. That was a bit of work to be able to do that problem. And then once I figured out the time of the thing, that's the time that the force will be acting on it. And average force times a time interval is equal to the change in momentum. And so several steps we had to work through on that one. Okay, here's a common collision situation. You may not have thought of it that way, but when you hit a tennis ball with your racket, when serving a tennis ball, a player hits the ball when its velocity is zero. So you toss it up into the air and when it's at its high point, if you toss it straight up, it has no horizontal velocity. And at the high point, its vertical velocity is zero. So zero initial momentum, but you exert a force of 500 newtons, 40 newtons on the ball for 5.00 milliseconds, giving it a final velocity of 45 meters per second. Using that data, find the mass of the ball. So this is a new mass measurement technique. You'd have somebody there, I don't know how you're gonna measure this that carefully, but uh, with a high speed camera, I guess, so here's the deal. You've got uh, a tennis ball that's sitting here at rest. You have a racket that's exerting a force on the ball and it's in somebody's hand, which I'm not even gonna try to draw. And the racket is moving in that direction at some initial velocity. And we're supposed to figure out the mass of the ball. Well, here's what we know. The average force F average times delta T, that's what we call an impulse. And it's the impulse that will change the momentum of the um, tennis ball, which is gonna be the change in momentum will be MV final minus MV initial, okay? That's a change in momentum. And we don't know the mass of the tennis ball, but we do know the final velocity. The initial velocity of it is zero. So we know the F average, we know the delta T, and we know the V final. So the only thing we don't know is the mass of the tennis ball. So let's simplify that equation and just write it F average times delta T and that's the duration of the thing there, 
is going to equal m v final and we know this we know that and we know this we just don't know the mass of the tennis ball so the mass will equal f average times delta t how long it lasts for which we could also just call it t divided by the v final hmm. well this is kind of neat the average force 540 newtons quite a bit delta t 5.00 times 10 to the minus third seconds um, notice that I wrote it out 5.00 okay that shows me how many significant figures I have and so this will help me solving the problem this number the 540 has two significant figures at least and that's as far as I can go I can't assume that that zero is significant and then I divide by the B final of 45.0 meters per second well, we have three significant figures on these two numbers, but only two on that one. So we'll have to stop at two here. And what will we get? Okay, I get that the mass of the tennis ball is about 6.0, yeah, only two sig figs that I can really significantly claim, uh, times 10 to the minus 2 kilograms. Oh, how do I know that? Well, I've, on top I've got Newton seconds divided by meters per second. A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So I have kilogram meter per second squared times seconds, which is a Newton, divided by 45, uh, let's see, 45, just meters per second down there. Let's see, so if I bring that up and multiply by a second over a meter, I'll have, oops, over a meter, I mean. Oh, this was a second over one. It was times a second. So second squared up top, second squared on the bottom, a meter on the bottom, a meter on the bottom. I'll get kilograms. Good. They did work out. So, I don't know if that's a reasonable mass for a tennis ball or not. A baseball is a little more than twice that, so I guess it's kind of okay. Okay, um, those are some impulse and momentum problems, and uh, hopefully you're getting somewhat familiar with that. Tomorrow we'll take a look at some collision problems, and then possibly a few more on Thursday, and then Next week is uh, review and then a last final test. So, and I'll try to get some stuff up on sapling for a, a final review. Although actually there's a fair amount of material up there right now. So, Do you know what data final is? Um, I'll look. The, Supposedly, we're at 10.30 class, supposedly Wednesday, so, um, and I'll have to pick some times on Wednesday that, uh, So like the 16th, basically? Yeah, the 16th. Okay. So it'd be, actually, our, if we were on the final schedule, <laughs> let's see what it says. Um, Yeah, it says 8 to 10 a.m., but we could have one at our regular class time and another one later in the day, sometime that'll be convenient, so everybody can pick a time. And 
uh, I'll just send out a doodle poll or something on that. Although there aren't that many people that poll, but. Uh, so will most of the final be over unit three or is it going to be fairly balanced about what it covers? Um, let's see, unit three will get a little bit more weight than units one and two do, but otherwise it's fairly balanced. Like, you know, if there were 15 problems on the final or something like that, um, if it was balanced, There'd be five from unit one, five from unit two, and five from unit three. Well, unit three might get six or seven problems instead. So, if that makes sense. Yeah, it might just have one problem more than it would if it was evenly spread. So that's how it'll work out anyway. Okay. All righty. Well, I'll turn you loose and see you tomorrow. I'm catching up on getting stuff posted up on Canvas. So I think I'm only one day behind up there now. So I should catch up by this afternoon sometime. <laughs>